All right, I think this will be the last one, probably. Finishing chapter 12, uh, which is uh, What's Wrong with Objectivist Metaphysics in um, George Lakoff's Women, Fire, and Dangerous Things, What Categories Reveal About the Mind. I was going through seven points uh, about the species that show that the concept of species doesn't fit uh, with uh, classical categorization. Sixth, the biological species concept cannot be interpreted as having any absolutely necessary conditions. The biological species concept includes a cluster of two conditions that go together in, a typical, in typical cases, a morphological condition and an interbreeding condition. Two populations represent different species if they are morphologically distinguished and do not interbreed, and they res represent the same species if they do interbreed and are morphologically similar to an appropriate degree. However, these two conditions do not always go together. Meyer cites the following situation. Meyer, 1984, page, three, uh, page 537. <coughs> Reproductive isolation without corresponding morphological change, that is, their physical characteristics are the same, but they can no longer breed. Morphological differentiation without reproductive isolation, that is, they can breed despite having very different physical characteristics. Uniparental reproduction, e.g. self-fertilization, parthenogenesis, pseudogamy, vegetative reproduction, etc. Here the issue of interbreeding cannot arise. These cases are important in two ways. First, they show that there can be no necessary degree of correlation between morphological similarity and interbreeding capabilities. That is, one cannot predict interbreeding capacity from similarity of physical properties and hence one cannot base an account of the role of species in evolution on the definition of species purely in terms of physical properties. Second, the cases taken together show that the very concept of a biological species is not a classical concept. Both morphological similarity and interbreeding capability are parts of the definition of a biological species, but neither is a necessary part. Thus, none of the defining characteristics of the biological concept species is necessary, and so the concept is not definable by necessary and sufficient conditions. Seventh, status as a separate species may depend on geographic location. A natural kind in the objectivist tradition is defined by inherent necessary and sufficient conditions. Classical natural kinds are not defined relative to location, because it's not inherent. In terms of the classical definition of natural kinds, the following statements are nonsense. Population A and B are the same kinds at one place and different kinds at another place. Population A and B live in a given habitat. They used to be different kinds and they have not changed, but the habitat has changed and now they are the same kind. Yet, with respect to the biological concept of the species, both cases actually occur. Here's Meyer's description of such situations. Attainment of different levels of speciation in different local populations. The perfecting of isolation mechanisms may proceed in different populations of a polytypic species when having several subspecies at different rates. Two widely overlapping species may, as a consequence, be completely distinct at certain localities but may freely hybridize at others. Reproductive isolation dependent on habitation isolation. Numerous cases have been described in the literature in which natural populations acted towards each other like good species in areas of contact as long as their habitats were undisturbed. Yet the reproductive isolation broke down as soon as characteristics of these habitats changed, usually by the interference of man, Meyer 1984a, page 537. In short, the characterization of biological species from evolutionary perspective shows that the biological world, world is not divided up into clearly distinguished natural kinds, as objectivist metaphysics requires. Yet, as Meyer points out, such phenomena are consequences of the gradual nature of the ordinary process of speciation. In short, evolution, which works gradually in local habitats to create new species, is inconsistent with objectivist metaphysics. Because of evolutionary theory, there are has had to be, in Meyer's terms, an emancipation of biology from an inappropriate philosophy. To summarize, the biological species concept fails to be a classical natural kind in the following ways. It does not have a homogeneous internal structure. It is defined relative to other groups. It is not defined solely with respect to properties of individuals. It does not have clear boundaries. It is not transitive. It does not have the necessary conditions. 
and it is dependent on geography. These are all consequences of characterizing a species within evolutionary theory. Meyer's biological concept of the species is by no means accepted throughout biology. It represents a middle ground between the phoneticist and the cladist since it uses both kind of criteria. As such, it is not accepted by either phoneticist or cladist. But this does not mean that other biological theories either purely phonetic or purely cladistic, provide comfort to those who accept objectivist metaphysics. Let us start with the phoneticists. So Colin and Crivello, 1984, provide a critique of the biological species concept. They accept Meyer's observation that the role of a population in evolution, its capacity to interbreed with other populations, cannot be predicted on the basis of overall similarity, that is, by phonetic criteria. Their solution is to disengage the concept of the species from evolutionary theory. They argue that the concept of the species is indeed phonetic, based on overall similarity, and that the concept of the species has nothing whatever to do with evolution. If we examine evolutionary situation within some ecosystem, we can generate the same theory based on localized biological populations without grouping sets of interbreeding populations into more abstract biological species. Parenthetically, we may point out that what we are probably what are probably the most important and progressive books on evolutionary theory that have been published within the last year or so essentially do not refer to the biological species at all, we conclude that the phonetic species is normally described and whose definition may be improved by numerical taxonomy is an appropriate concept to be associated with the taxonomic category species, while the local population may be the most useful unit for evolutionary study. So Colin Crivello, 1984, pages 562 to 63. So back to Lakoff. But their alternative is not a classical one. Again, quoting Sokal and Crivello. Ins insistence on a phonetic species concept leads inevitably to a conceptualization of species as dense regions within a hyperdimensional environmental space. Page 564. The phonetic species concept is statistical, not discrete. The dense regions represent high statistical correlation of attributes. Thus, this species concept does not have a clear boundaries and is not defined by necessary and sufficient conditions. It's very much like Wittgenstein's view of categories as defined by family resemblances. It should be pointed out that, even among phoneticists, there is considerable disagreement on these matters. First, there are different kinds of statistical methods which yield different results. Second, there do exist attempts to characterize a phonetic species concept that plays a role in evolution. See Sober 1984. Cladistic categorization looks like a form of classical categorization, but it provides little comfort to the classical view of natural kinds. On a cladistic view, all categorization is historical and based only on the history of derived char characters. This view results in categories that seem like anything but natural kinds. As Gould has observed, cladistic categorization produces a taxonomy in which lungfish are closer to rhinos than to tuna. As Meyer points out, Meyer 1984 pages 654 to 55, cladistic ca categorization yields one category that includes only birds and crocodiles, but not other reptiles. This example is worth some discussion since it gives one a sense of what cladistic categorization is all about. Birds descended from a branch of the reptiles, the archosauri. So did pterodactyls, dinosaurs, and crocodilians. After the Archosauri branched off from other reptiles, it acquired certain characteristics which distinguished it from other reptiles. These characteristics, called synapomorphies, are shared by birds and crocodiles today. After birds and crocodiles branched off from Archosauria, they each acquired new characteristics all their own called autopomorphies. Is that right? A top Autopomorphies, I don't know, some linguistic term. The crocodiles didn't acquire very many of them. They remained pretty much the same, but birds, which had to adapt to living in the air, acquired a great many autopomorphic characters, that is, characters that birds have but crocodiles don't. In setting up taxonomies, cladists only count synapomorphies and not autopomorphies. Hence, the surviving descendants of the arcsauri birds and crocodiles are grouped together by cladus. Crocodiles are not grouped with other reptiles, even though they are much more like other reptiles today than they are like birds. Thus, the cladus pretty much ignore the ecological component of evolution in ignoring the autopomorphies in birds, those characteristics that birds developed 
and adapting to an aerial environment. Such cases are not rare, there are hundreds of them. Cladistic categorization tries to be true to history, at least to one aspect of it, but a history-only view of categorization is not what classical theorists had in mind. Objective similarities on this view means objective similarities that have, der have derived, that is, synapomorphic characters. Thus, when a given property got there in the history of the species is all that matters when the cladus decides whether that property is to count for establishing categories on classical grounds. Even current biological function does not matter, nor do major aspects of evolutionary theory matter. Selection pressures, shifts of adaptive zones, evolutionary rates, etc. On the cladistic view, a great many important aspects of biology play no role in determining biological categories. Objectivist metaphysics requires that there be only one correct categorization scheme. If that is a cladistic scheme, then many of our most familiar categories, like zebras and fish, will be seen as non-existent, and a number of evolutionary processes that play an important role in determining the development of species will be left out of the picture. The cladistic view, with a little charitable stretching in the time dimension, may be seen as fitting objectivist metaphysics. It, of course, does not fit objectivist semantics and cognition, since the categories it yields do not fit the categories of language and mind, like zebra and fish. Thus, the only version of contemporary biology that seems consistent with objectivist metaphysics is still inconsistent with other aspects of objectivist philosophy. It is also inconsistent with the spirit of the view of classification built into objective metaphysics. It may be construed as being consistent with the letter of the objectivist metaphysics, in which case crocodiles are objectively categorized only with birds and not with other reptiles. Of all the current biological theories, only cladism might be interpreted as being consistent with objectivist metaphysics on the issue of categorization, and then only by ignoring vital aspects of evolutionary biology. Objectivist philosophy likes to view itself as having science on its side. In the case of biological categories, science is not on its side. Classical categories and natural kinds are remnants of pre-Darwinian philosophy. They fit the biology of the ancient Greeks very well, and even the biology of local naturalists such as Linnaeus, but they do not accord with the phenomena that are central to evolution, variation within species, adaptation to the environment, gradual change, gene pools, etc. Whatever one's choices are in the styles of contemporary biology, objectivist semantics and cognition, and to a large extent, even objectivist metaphysics are in conflict with post-Darwinian biology. I'd put my money on biology. Me too. That's the chapter. Thank you.